Chapter 19 Public Dinners All public dinners in London, from the Lord Mayor's annual banquet at Guildhall to the chimney sweeper's anniversary at White Conduit House, from the goldsmiths to the butchers, from the sheriffs to the licensed victuallers, are amusing scenes. Of all entertainments of this description, however, we think the annual dinner of some public charity is the most amusing. At a company's dinner, the people are nearly all alike, regular old stagers, who make it a matter of business and a thing not to be laughed at. At a political dinner, everybody is disagreeable and inclined to speechify, much the same thing by the by. But at a charity dinner, you see people of all sorts, kinds, and descriptions. The wine may not be remarkably special, to be sure, and we have heard some hard-hearted monsters grumble at the collection, but we really think the amusement to be derived from the occasion sufficient to counterbalance even these disadvantages. Let us suppose you are induced to attend a dinner of this description. Indigent Orphans Friends Benevolent Institution, we think it is. The name of the charity is a line or two longer, but never mind the rest. You have a distinct recollection, however, that you purchased a ticket at the solicitation of some charitable friend, and you deposit yourself in a hackney coach, the driver of which, no doubt that you may do the thing in style, turns a deaf ear to your earnest entreaties to be set down at the corner of Great Queen Street, and persists in carrying you to the very doors of the Freemasons, round which a crowd of people are assembled to witness the entrance of the indigent orphan's friends. You hear great speculations as you pay the fare, on the possibility of your being the noble lord who is announced to fill the chair on the occasion, and are highly gratified to hear it eventually decided that you are only a vocalist. The first thing that strikes you on your entrance is the astonishing importance of the committee. You observe a door on the first landing, carefully guarded by two waiters, in and out of which stout gentlemen with very red faces keep running, with a degree of speed highly unbecoming the gravity of persons of their years and corpulency. You pause, quite alarmed at the bustle, and thinking, in your innocence, that two or three people must have been carried out of the dining room in fits at least. You are immediately undeceived by the waiter. Upstairs, if you please, sir. This is the committee room. Upstairs you go accordingly, wondering, as you mount, what the duties of the committee can be, and whether they ever do anything beyond confusing each other and running over the waiters. Having deposited your hat and cloak, and received a remarkably small scrap of pasteboard in exchange, which, as a matter of course, you lose before you require it again, you enter the hall, down which there are three long tables for the less distinguished guests, with a cross table on a raised platform at the upper end for the reception of the very particular friends of the indigent orphans. Being fortunate enough to find a plate without anybody's card in it, you wisely seat yourself at once and have a little leisure to look about you. Waiters, with wine baskets in their hands, are placing decanters of sherry down the tables at very respectable distances. Melancholy-looking salt cellars and decayed vinegar cruets, which might have belonged to the parents of the indigent orphans in their time, are scattered at distant intervals on the cloth, and the knives and forks look as if they had done duty at every public dinner in London since the accession of George I. The musicians are scraping and grating and screwing tremendously, playing no notes but notes of preparation, and several gentlemen are gliding along the sides of the tables, looking into plate after plate with frantic eagerness, the expression of their countenances growing more and more dismal as they meet with everybody's card but their own. You turn round to take a look at the table behind you, and, not being in the habit of attending public dinners, are somewhat struck by the appearance of the party on which your eyes rest. One of its principal members appears to be a little man, with a long and rather inflamed face, and gray hair brushed bolt upright in front. He wears a wisp of black silk round his neck, without any stiffener, as an apology for a neckerchief, and is addressed by his companions by the familiar appellation of Fitz, or some such monosyllable. 
Near him is a stout man in a white neckerchief and buff waistcoat, with shining dark hair cut very short in front, and a great, round, healthy-looking face, on which he studiously preserves a half-sentimental simper. Next to him, again, is a large-headed man with black hair and bushy whiskers, and opposite them are two or three others, one of whom is a little round-faced person in a dress stock and blue under-waistcoat. There is something peculiar in their air and manner, though you could hardly describe what it is. You cannot divest yourself of the idea that they have come for some other purpose than mere eating and drinking. You have no time to debate the matter, however, for the waiters, who have been arranged in lines down the room, placing the dishes on the table, retire to the lower end. The dark man in the blue coat and bright buttons, who has the direction of the music, looks up to the gallery and calls out, BAND! in a very loud voice. Out burst the orchestra, up rise the visitors, in March 14 stewards, each with a long wand in his hand, like the evil genius in a pantomime. Then the chairman, then the titled visitors, they all make their way up the room as fast as they can, bowing and smiling and smirking and looking remarkably amiable. The applause ceases, grace is said, the clatter of plates and dishes begins, and everyone appears highly gratified, either with the presence of the distinguished visitors or the commencement of the anxiously expected dinner. As to the dinner itself, the mere dinner, it goes off much the same everywhere. Tureens of soup are emptied with awful rapidity. Waiters take plates of turbot away to get lobster sauce and bring back plates of lobster sauce without turbot. People who can carve poultry are great fools if they own it and people who can't have no wish to learn. The knives and forks form a pleasing accompaniment to Aubrey's music, and Aubrey's music would form a pleasing accompaniment to the dinner if you could hear anything besides the cymbals. The substantials disappear, molds of jelly vanish like lightning, hearty eaters wipe their foreheads and appear rather overcome by their recent exertions. People who have looked very cross hitherto become remarkably bland, and ask you to take wine in the most friendly manner possible. Old gentlemen direct your attention to the ladies' gallery, and take great pains to impress you with the fact that the charity is always peculiarly favored in this respect. Everyone appears disposed to become talkative, and the hum of conversation is loud and general. Pray silence, gentlemen, if you please, for non nobis, shouts the Toastmaster with stentorian lungs. A Toastmaster's shirt front, waistcoat, and neckerchief, by the by, always exhibit three distinct shades of cloudy white. Pray silence, gentlemen, for non nobis. The singers, whom you discover to be no other than the very party that excited your curiosity at first, after pitching their voices immediately begin two tooing most dismally, on which the regular old stagers burst into occasional cries of shh, shh. Waiters! Silence, waiters! Stand still, waiters! Keep back, waiters! And other exorcisms, delivered in a tone of indignant remonstrance. The grace is soon concluded, and the company resume their seats. The uninitiated portion of the guests applaud non nobis as vehemently as if it were a capital comic song, greatly to the scandal and indignation of the regular diners who immediately attempt to quell this sacrilegious approbation by cries of hush, hush, whereupon the others, mistaking these sounds for hisses, applaud more tumultuously than before, and, by way of placing their approval beyond the possibility of doubt, shout encore most vociferously. The moment the noise ceases, up starts the Toastmaster. Gentlemen, charge your glasses if you please. Decanters having been handed about, and glasses filled, the Toastmaster proceeds in a regular ascending scale. Gentlemen, ere you all charged, pray silence, gentlemen, for the chair. The chairman rises, and, after stating that he feels it quite unnecessary to preface the toast he is about to propose, with any observations whatever, wanders into a maze of sentences, and flounders about in the most extraordinary manner, presenting a lamentable spectacle of mystified humanity until he arrives at the words, Constitutional Sovereign of these realms, at which elderly gentlemen exclaim, Bravo! and hammer the table tremendously with their knife handles. Under any circumstances, it would give him the greatest pride. 
it would give him the greatest pleasure, he might almost say, it would afford him the satisfaction, cheers, to propose that toast. What must be his feelings, then, when he has the gratification of announcing that he has received Her Majesty's commands to apply to the treasurer of Her Majesty's household for Her Majesty's annual donation of twenty-five pounds in aid of the funds of this charity. This announcement, which has been regularly made by every chairman since the first foundation of the charity, forty-two years ago, calls forth the most vociferous applause. The toast is drunk with a great deal of cheering and knocking, and God Save the Queen is sung by the professional gentleman, the unprofessional gentleman joining in the chorus, and giving the national anthem an effect, which the newspapers, with great justice, describe as perfectly electrical. The other loyal and patriotic toasts having been drunk with all due enthusiasm, a comic song having been well sung by the gentleman with the small neckerchief, and a sentimental one by the second of the party, we come to the most important toast of the evening. Prosperity to the charity. Here again we are compelled to adopt newspaper phraseology, and to express our regret at being precluded from giving even the substance of the noble lord's observations. Suffice it to say that the speech, which is somewhat of the longest, is rapturously received, and the toast having been drunk, the stewards, looking more important than ever, leave the room and presently return, heading a procession of indigent orphans, boys and girls, who walk round the room, curtsying and bowing and treading on each other's heels, and looking very much as if they would like a glass of wine apiece, to the high gratification of the company generally, and especially of the lady patronesses in the gallery. Exunt children, and re-enter stewards, each with a blue plate in his hand. The band plays a lively air. The majority of the company put their hands in their pockets and look rather serious. And the noise of sovereigns, rattling on crockery, is heard from all parts of the room. After a short interval, occupied in singing and toasting, the secretary puts on his spectacles and proceeds to read the report and list of subscriptions, the latter being listened to with great attention. Mr. Smith, one guinea. Mr. Tompkins, one guinea. Mr. Wilson, one guinea. Mr. Hickson, one guinea. Mr. Nixon, one guinea. Mr. Charles Nixon, one guinea. Here, here. Mr. James Nixon, one guinea. Mr. Thomas Nixon, one pound one. Tremendous applause. Lord Fitzbinkle, the chairman of the day, in addition to an annual donation of 15 pounds, 30 guineas. Prolonged knocking. Several gentlemen knock the stems off their wine glasses in the vehemence of their approbation. Lady Fitzbinkle, in addition to an annual donation of 10 pound, 20 pound. Protracted knocking and shouts of, Bravo! The list being at length concluded, the chairman rises and proposes the health of the secretary, than whom he knows no more zealous or estimable individual. The secretary, in returning thanks, observes that he knows no more excellent individual than the chairman, except the senior officer of the charity, whose health he begs to propose. The senior officer, in returning thanks, observes that he knows no more worthy man than the secretary, except Mr. Walker, the auditor, whose health he begs to propose. Mr. Walker, in returning thanks, discovers some other estimable individual to whom alone the senior officer is inferior, and so they go on toasting and lauding and thanking, the only other toast of importance being the lady patronesses now present, on which all the gentlemen turn their faces towards the ladies' gallery, shouting tremendously, and little priggish men, who have imbibed more wine than usual, kiss their hands and exhibit distressing contortions of visage. We have protracted our dinner to so great a length that we have hardly time to add one word by way of grace. We can only entreat our readers not to imagine, because we have attempted to extract some amusement from a charity dinner, that we are at all disposed to underrate either the excellence of the benevolent institutions with which London abounds, or the estimable motives of those who support them. Chapter 20, The First of May Now, ladies, up in the sky parlor, only once a year, if you please. Young lady with brass ladle. Sweep, sweep, sweep. Illegal watchword. The First of May. 
There is a merry freshness in the sound, calling to our minds a thousand thoughts of all that is pleasant in nature and beautiful in her most delightful form. What man is there over whose mind a bright spring morning does not exercise a magic influence, carrying him back to the days of his childish sports and conjuring up before him the old green fields with its gently waving trees, where the birds sang as he has never heard them since, where the butterfly fluttered far more gaily than he has ever seen him now, in all his ramblings, where the sky seemed bluer and the sun shone more brightly, where the air blew more freshly over greener grass and sweeter-smelling flowers, where everything wore a richer and more brilliant hue than it is ever dressed in now. Such are the deep feelings of childhood, and such are the impressions which every lovely object stamps upon its heart. The hardy traveler wanders through the maze of thick and pathless woods, where the sun's rays never shone, and heaven's pure air never played. He stands on the brink of the roaring waterfall, and, giddy and bewildered, watches the foaming mass as it leaps from stone to stone and from crag to crag. He lingers in the fertile plains of a land of perpetual sunshine, and revels in the luxury of their balmy breath. But what are the deep forests, or the thundering waters, or the richest landscapes that bounteous nature ever spread, to charm the eyes and captivate the senses of man, compared with the recollection of the old scenes of his early youth? Magic scenes indeed, for the fancies of childhood dressed them in colors brighter than the rainbow, and almost as fleeting. In former times, spring brought with it not only such associations as these, connected with the past, but sports and games for the present. Miri dances round rustic pillars, adorned with emblems of the season, and reared in honor of its coming. Where are they now? Pillars we have, but they are no longer rustic ones. And as to dancers, they are used to rooms and lights, and would not show well in the open air. Think of the immorality, too. What would your Sabbath enthusiasts say to an aristocratic ring encircling the Duke of York's column in Carlton Terrace, a grand poissot of the middle classes around Alderman Waithman's monument in Fleet Street, or a general hands for a round of ten-pound householders at the foot of the obelisk in St. George's Field? Alas, Romance can make no head against the riot act, and pastoral simplicity is not understood by the police. Well, many years ago we began to be a steady and matter-of-fact sort of people, and dancing in spring being beneath our dignity, we gave it up, and in course of time it descended to the sweeps. A fall, certainly, because those sweeps are very good fellows in their way, and moreover very useful in a civilized community, they are not exactly the sort of people who give the tone to the little elegances of society. The sweeps, however, got the dancing to themselves, and they kept it up and handed it down. This was a severe blow to the romance of springtime, but it did not entirely destroy it either, for a portion of it descended to the sweeps with the dancing and rendered them objects of great interest. A mystery hung over the sweeps in those days, Legends were in existence of wealthy gentlemen who had lost children, and who, after many years of sorrow and suffering, had found them in the character of sweeps. Stories were related of a young boy who, having been stolen from his parents in his infancy, and devoted to the occupation of chimney sweeping, was sent, in the course of his professional career, to sweep the chimney of his mother's bedroom, and how, being hot and tired when he came out of the chimney, he got into the bed he had so often slept in as an infant, and was discovered and recognized therein by his mother, who once every year of her life thereafter requested the pleasure of the company of every London sweep at half-past one o'clock to roast beef, plum pudding, porter, and sixpence. Such stories as these, and there were many such, threw an air of mystery round the sweeps, and produced for them some of those good effects which animals derive from the doctrine of the transmigration of souls. No one, except the masters, thought of ill-treating a sweep, because no one knew who he might be, or what nobleman's or gentleman's son he might turn out. Chimney sweeping was, by many believers in the marvelous, considered as a sort of probationary term, at an earlier or later period of which, 
diverse young noblemen were to come into possession of their rank and titles, and the profession was held by them in great respect accordingly. We remember in our young days a little sweep about our own age, with curly hair and white teeth, whom we devoutly and sincerely believed to be the lost son and heir of some illustrious personage, an impression which was resolved into an unchangeable conviction on our infant mind by the subject of our speculation informing us one day, in reply to our question, propounded a few moments before his ascent to the summit of the kitchen chimney, that he believed he'd been born in the Vercus, but he'd never knowed his father. We felt certain, from that time forth, that he would one day be owned by a lord, and we never heard the church bells ring, or saw a flag hoisted in the neighborhood, without thinking that the happy event had at last occurred, and that his long-lost parent had arrived in a coach and six to take him home to Grosvenor Square. He never came, however, and, at the present moment, the young gentleman in question is settled down as a master sweep in the neighborhood of Battlebridge, his distinguishing characteristics being a decided antipathy to washing himself, and the possession of a pair of legs very inadequate to the support of his unwieldy and corpulent body. The romance of spring having gone out before our time, we were fain to console ourselves as we best could with the uncertainty that enveloped the birth and parentage of its attendant dancers, the sweeps, and we did console ourselves with it for many years. But even this wicked source of comfort received a shock from which it has never recovered, a shock which has been in reality its death blow. We could not disguise from ourselves the fact that whole families of sweeps were regularly born of sweeps in the rural districts of Summerstown and Camden Town, that the eldest son succeeded to the father's business, that the other branches assisted him therein, and commenced on their own account, that their children again were educated to the profession, and that about their identity there could be no mistake whatever. We could not be blind, we say, to this melancholy truth, but we could not bring ourselves to admit it nevertheless, and we lived on for some years in a state of voluntary ignorance. We were roused from our pleasant slumber by certain dark insinuations thrown out by a friend of ours to the effect that children in the lower ranks of life were beginning to choose chimney sweeping as their particular walk, that applications had been made by various boys to the constituted authorities to allow them to pursue the object of their ambition with the full concurrence and sanction of the law that the affair, in short, was becoming one of mere legal contract. We turned a deaf ear to these rumors at first, but slowly and surely they stole upon us. Month after month, week after week, nay, day after day at last, did we meet with accounts of similar applications. The veil was removed, all mystery was at an end, and chimney sweeping had become a favorite and chosen pursuit. There is no longer any occasion to steal boys for boys flock in crowds to bind themselves. The romance of the trade has fled, and the chimney sweeper of the present day is no more like unto him of thirty years ago than is a Fleet Street pickpocket to a Spanish brigand or Paul Pry to Caleb Williams. This gradual decay and disuse of the practice of leading noble youths into captivity and compelling them to ascend chimneys was a severe blow, if we may speak, to the romance of chimney sweeping, and to the romance of spring at the same time. But even this was not all, for some few years ago the dancing on May Day began to decline. Small sweeps were observed to congregate in twos or threes, unsupported by a green, with no my lord, to act as master of the ceremonies, and no my lady to preside over the exchequer. Even in companies where there was a green, it was an absolute nothing, a mere sprout, and the instrumental accompaniments rarely extended beyond the shovels and set of panpipes, better known to the many as a mouth organ. These were signs of the times, portentous omens of a coming change. And what was the result which they shadowed forth? Why, the master sweeps, influenced by a restless spirit of innovation, actually interposed their authority in opposition to the dancing, and substituted a dinner an anniversary dinner at White Conduit House, where clean faces appeared in lieu of black ones smeared with rose pink, and knee cords and tops superseded nankeen drawers and roseted shoes. Gentlemen who were in the habit of riding shy horses, 
and steady-going people who have no vacancy in their souls, lauded this alteration to the skies, and the conduct of the master sweeps was described beyond the reach of praise. But how stands the real fact? Let any man deny, if he can, that when the cloth had been removed, fresh pots and pipes laid on the table, and the customary loyal and patriotic toasts proposed, the celebrated Mr. Sluffin of Adam and Eve Court, whose authority not the most malignant of our opponents can call in question, expressed himself in a manner following, that now he cotched the chairman's high, he wished he might be jolly vel blessed if he weren't a going to have his innings, which he would say these here observations, that how some mischievous coves, as know nothing about the concern, had tried to set people again the mass of sweeps, and take the shine out of their business, and bread out of the traps of their precious kids, by a making of this ear remark, as chimbleys could be as well swept by sheenery as by boys, and that the making use of boys for that their purpose was barbarous, thereas he had been a chummy. He begged the chairman's pardon for using such a vulgar expression, more nor thought a year, he might say he'd been born in a chimbley, and he'd knowed uncommon veil as sheenery was vus no no use. And as to cruelty to the boys, everybody in the chimbley line knowed as well as they did that they liked the climbing better nor nothing as vus. From this day, we date the total fall of the last lingering remnant of May Day dancing among the elite of the profession. And from this period, we commence a new era in that portion of our spring associations, which relates to the 1st of May. We are aware that the unthinking part of the population will meet us here, with the assertion that dancing on May Day still continues, that greens are annually seen to roll along the streets, that youths in the garb of clowns precede them, giving vent to the ebullitions of their sportive fancies, and that lords and ladies follow in their wake. Granted, we are ready to acknowledge that in outward show, these processions have greatly improved. We do not deny the introduction of solos on the drum. We will go even so far as to admit an occasional fantasia on the triangle. But here our admissions end. We positively deny that the sweeps have art or part in these proceedings. We distinctly charge the dustmen with throwing what they ought to clear away into the eyes of the public. We accuse scavengers, brickmakers, and gentlemen who devote their energies to the costermongering line with obtaining money once a year under false pretenses. We cling with peculiar fondness to the custom of days gone by and have shut out conviction as long as we could, but it has forced itself upon us. And we now proclaim to a deluded public that the May Day dancers are not sweeps. The size of them alone is sufficient to repudiate the idea. It is a notorious fact that the widely spread taste for register stoves has materially increased the demand for small boys, whereas the men who, under a fictitious character, dance about the streets on the 1st of May nowadays would be a tight fit in a kitchen flue, to say nothing of the parlor. This is strong presumptive evidence, but we have positive proof, the evidence of our own senses. And here is our testimony. Upon the morning of the second of the merry month of May, in the year of our Lord, 1,836, we went out for a stroll, with a kind of forlorn hope of seeing something or other which might induce us to believe that it was really spring and not Christmas. After wandering as far as Copenhagen House, without meeting anything calculated to dispel our impression that there was a mistake in the almanacs, we turned back down Maiden Lane, with the intention of passing through the extensive colony lying between it and Battlebridge, which is inhabited by proprietors of donkey carts, boilers of horse flesh, makers of tiles, and sifters of cinders, through which colony we should have passed, without stoppage or interruption, if a little crowd gathered round a shed had not attracted our attention and induced us to pause. When we say a shed, we do not mean the conservatory sort of building, which, according to the old song, love tenanted when he was a young man, but a wooden house with windows stuffed with rags and paper, and a small yard at the side, with one dust cart, two baskets, and a few shovels, and little heaps of cinders, and fragments of china and tiles, scattered about it. Before this inviting spot we paused, and the longer we looked, the more we wondered what exciting circumstance it could be 
that induced the foremost members of the crowd to flatten their noses against the parlor window in the vain hope of catching a glimpse of what was going on inside. After staring vacantly about us for some minutes, we appealed, touching the cause of this assemblage, to a gentleman in a suit of tarpaulin who was smoking his pipe on our right hand, but as the only answer we obtained was a playful inquiry whether our mother had disposed of her mangle, we determined to await the issue in silence. Judge of our virtuous indignation when the street door of the shed opened and a party emerged therefrom, clad in the costume and emulating the appearance of May Day sweeps. The first person who appeared was my lord, habited in a blue coat and bright buttons, with gilt paper tacked over the seams, yellow knee breeches, pink cotton stockings and shoes, a cocked hat ornamented with shreds of various colored paper on his head, a bouquet the size of a prized cauliflower in his buttonhole, a long belcher handkerchief in his right hand, and a thin cane in his left. A murmur of applause ran through the crowd, which was chiefly composed of his lordship's personal friends. When this graceful figure made his appearance, which swelled into a burst of applause as his fair partner in the dance bounded forth to join him. Her ladyship was attired in pink crepe over bed furniture, with a low body and short sleeves. The symmetry of her ankles was partially concealed by a very perceptible pair of frilled trousers, and the inconvenience which might have resulted from the circumstance of her white satin shoes being a few sizes too large was obviated by their being firmly attached to her legs with strong tape sandals. Her head was ornamented with a profusion of artificial flowers, and in her hand she bore a large brass ladle, wherein to receive what she figuratively denominated the tin. The other characters were a young gentleman in girl's clothes and a widow's cap, two clowns who walked upon their hands in the mud, to the immeasurable delight of all the spectators, a man with a drum, another man with a flagello, a dirty woman in a large shawl, with a box under her arm for the money, and last, though not least, the green, animated by no less a personage than our identical friend in the tarpaulin suit. The man hammered away at the drum, the flagello squeaked, the shovels rattled, the green rolled about, pitching first on one side and then on the other. My lady threw her right foot over her left ankle and her left foot over her right ankle alternately. My lord ran a few paces forward and butted at the green, and then a few paces backward upon the toes of the crowd, and then went to the right, and then to the left, and then dodged my lady round the green, and finally drew her arm through his, and called upon the boys to shout, which they did lustily, for this was the dancing. We passed the same group accidentally in the evening. We never saw a green so drunk, a lord so quarrelsome, no, not even in the house of peers after dinner, a pair of clowns so melancholy, a lady so muddy, or a party so miserable. How has May Day decayed?